blinking over there. We're jumping and going and <clears throat> talking about transformation pitfalls. And last week I kind of gave you a definition. I just kind of read it really fast through and, and this week I want to elaborate on what transformation actually is. So I want to elaborate on that a little bit before we get into it because we really want to get this understanding that transformation is an inward activity whereby we partner with the Holy Spirit in the process of <clears throat> recreating us back to our original design for the purpose of fulfilling our God-given destiny. So that's important to kind of understand what transformation actually is. It's an inward activity because anytime we think about doing something, we always think about an external activity. And usually when we think about going inside, we get, as we heard earlier, those feelings, that anxiousness, that fear, whatever, and we quit. And we allow that to stop us. So we got to understand transformation is an inward activity where we may feel and go through different sets of emotions, different thoughts, things that we didn't want to think about anymore for the purpose of getting rid of it that we are actually changed. Because if we don't press through to that place, we usually end up just using behavioral modification techniques to make us a better person. And that's not what transformation is. See, we hear a lot of good self-help messages being preached in the Church of God today, but no one's being transformed. All they're doing is changing their behavior. So we want to remember it's to bring us back to that original design. And we've got to understand our, our original design is all messed up. Due because of what we call original sin. We were born into this world sinners. Not because of what we did. When you showed up on the scene, you're already born in trespasses and in sin because of what Adam had done. And then we have our upbringing that messes us up. And we have life experiences that mess us up. And then we have life's trauma that messes us up. And then we get educated with world's philosophies in this world. We get messed up. And everything of this world is designed to make you a spiritual failure. So we've got to understand that. And what we try to do as born-again human beings is we want to live out the things we've learned in our upbringing and everything else, not understanding that, no, that's going to cause us to fail spiritually. But if I just sprinkle a little Jesus on it, I'll be okay, right? No, because that, now you're just trying to modify your behavior with Jesus. It doesn't work that way. We need to be transformed. It said, whereby we partner with the Holy Spirit. That means we have to actively participate in the process. Because a lot of times we'll just sit there and say, okay, God, do whatever you want to do. And we sit there and nothing happens. Okay, God, I'm listening. If you want to say something to me, nothing happens. Okay, God, my eyes are open. You want to show me anything? Nothing happens. Because it doesn't work that way. We got to engage God in a spiritual fashion and seek Him to recreate us on the inside. Again, we always think of activity as an outside process, but it's not. And we want Him to cleanse those gates that have been all mucked up with those, that upbringing and those life experiences and trauma and all that stuff. For the purpose of recreating us back to our original design. So again, I've already said this, we can't walk out our spiritual nature in our humanity. And so many people are trying to do it and getting frustrated and just quitting because they're like, it ain't working. Well, I'm doing everything you're telling me, but it ain't working. Well, one, why are you doing what I'm telling you to do? I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to point you to God. You know, equip the saints by pointing you to God. So that we may fulfill our God-given destiny. That is the reason why you exist. No one else on this earth is equipped and designed to do what you can do. Because if there were one of you, wouldn't be necessary. So you're the only one that can do your God-given destiny. That's why we're here at this time, even in this time frame in time, to carry that all out. Now the thing we've got to understand is the devil also understands that principle and he's going to do everything in his power to derail you in this process. That's why he places pitfalls in our way. And what he does is he preys on your weaknesses.
because he knows what he's been able to get to you with in the past. And he keeps trying to do that. See, transformation recreates you into something completely different than you are now. And the no devil can no longer use that natural weakness against you. Why? Because now it's gone. You've been transformed. It's been removed. That's one of the things that really bothers me about um, like rehab programs. They constantly tell you you're always going to be one of those things. No, you're not. Why would you embed that lie into somebody? It's not them. It's the devil trying to say, hey, you ain't never going to change. Yeah, maybe you can quit drinking or doing drugs. Yeah, you can modify your behavior for how long? Until you finally give in. See, when you transform, that doesn't happen anymore, and the devil knows that. That's why he wants to stop you any way along the process. So again, we want to inwardly think this verse I want you to, when you read the scriptures now, start thinking inwardly instead of externally. Start allowing the Spirit of God to bring revelation to you about the Word of God on how you can use it for transformational purposes. Like this verse here, it says Galatians 6, 9, is in the Amplified. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint and acting nobly and doing right. So that's what we think. I got to do these right activities, right activities, and I got to keep doing them whether I feel like it or not or whatever. No, no, no. Think on the inside. For in due time, at the appointed season. That's huge for some of you. At the appointed season. See, you want it now. You ain't ready for it now in some cases. Because if you got it now, you'd hurt yourself with it. That's why you can't give your 12-year-old a brand new car. They'll hurt themselves with it. They're not ready yet. Are they physically capable and probably able to drive it? Probably. In a physical sense. It says, at the appointed time we'll reap if we do not loosen or relax our courage and faint. And again, this text reminds me just quickly about what we talked about last week, how the devil preys upon our frailties. This is where I want to get a little personal. Let me illustrate what I mean. How he uses your natural frailties and weaknesses against you to keep you from enduring, to keep you from persevering. So in the past, I had an issue with endurance. So I never stayed at a church as the pastor for more than four or five years. Never. And I even remember when I came to this church, and I was the interim, and then asked to submit a resume to become the pastor. And then I remember at the interview, I remember Rick was there. Were you there? Okay, these two were there anyway. And one of the questions came up on my thing because on my resume they saw it so many times I quit. And somebody asked me about it. I forget who at the time. And I said, that's true. He says, and what I'd like you to do is pray for me because I need to break that thing. Pray that that thing can get broken. See, I lacked endurance because, I'm going to read this because I, I wrote it out specifically for this, because my endurance level was actually based in and functioned from my natural willpower. That's where my endurance was based in, my willpower. It says, see, the devil knew this. So he would exert external pressures in my life until my willpower shattered and caused me to run which relieved the pressure. You know, that's what I did in the first church. It just got pressure and pressure and pressure, and I found like, ran. I'm done with this. And then it happened again. And it happened again. Because the devil knew if he could put enough pressure on me, I'd run, because that was my track record. So we prayed, and I prayed that that would be transformed. So you can continue to put behavioral modification principles in place, but if your 
endurance is truly based in your own physical willpower, then there'll be a place where you will quit. So, <clears throat> I've been transformed. I'm not that guy anymore. How do we know? Well, I took the pastorate in 2008. And I'm still here. So you do the math. I think that's a little more than four or five years. In fact, a bunch of people that are in that pastoral questioning group ain't even here. Two are. In fact, a bunch of those folk ain't here. Few you are. And I'll admit, I've never faced as much external pressure in my life as I have have while pastoring this church. Never. Never. I doubt many others have endured the external pressure I have. Now again, please don't misunderstand me and what I'm saying. I'm certainly not bragging on myself. I'm boldly testifying of the faithfulness and goodness of God and his transforming power by the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm still standing here. Because I've been transformed. I'm not doing this in my willpower anymore. See, and if it can happen to me, it can happen for you. See, that's why some of you may take it wrong when I say, I'm not here for you. Like I say, when I say a lot of this stuff, I need to speak it out of my mouth so my head hears it and it gets reinforced in my spirit. I'm here until God tells me to leave here. Not until anyone else tells me to leave here. And as I've told you, believe me, I've asked him over the years. <laughs> and he's not given me the release. So I'm still here. Why? Because I'm not here doing it out of my own willpower serving people. I'm here serving God because he's called me here and placed me here for this day and hour to complete a mission. That's what transformation does. Transformation gets you to a place that you are no longer the same, so you're no longer dealing with the same things. It didn't mean the pressure changed. No, the pressure got even worse. But it didn't matter because I wasn't that guy that runs anymore. Because I've been transformed. That's what we need to get to. So let me just give you two more scriptures, especially in this area of endurance, because I see a lot of people quitting. And that's what's going to happen in the end times. They're only going to endure because of the external pressures. And when push comes to shove, some may quit and run because of the pressure. So it says in Mark 13, 13 in the Passion Translation, it says this. Expect to be hated by all. Just expect it. Just expect it. Did I say expect it? Because I'm not sure you heard me say expect it. But just expect it. Stop like, I'm shocked. People hate me. God don't, and he's the only one that matters. And if he's the only one, who cares? He's the best one to have on your side. So expect to be hated by all because of your allegiance to the cause that bears my name, he said. Because of your allegiance to the cause, you're going to be hated. You're going to be hated simply because you're a Christian and people will know nothing about you. I'm ratcheting that up too. Man, I got some new t-shirts. I got a couple hats coming. Can't wait till my hat comes. It says, Jesus is my boss. <laughs> hey, guy in the gold tome, you ain't my boss. Hey, illegitimate guy sitting at the Capitol in D.C., you ain't my boss. None of you is my boss. See, I'm, I'm even proclaiming it. I only got one boss, and his name's Jesus. Now, I ain't doing that to be ignorant and stupid and foolish. Again, I do a lot of things to remind myself because I need to know that I know that I know. I need to ingrain it in me because when push comes to shove, that's where you find out where you really stand. So he says, look, you're going to be hated because of my name. 
Now catch this next phrase. If you're looking at the notes, it's bold in purple and underlined. I can't get much more than that. But determined to be faithful. So you don't determine to be faithful when the pressure's on. You don't determine what you're going to do when the situation happens. You determine what's going to happen before the situation happens. Determined to be faithful. I'm going to be faithful. Case closed. Yeah, but. No, there is no yeah, buts. What if this happens? It doesn't matter. My faithfulness is not conditioned on the situation or the circumstances. My faithfulness is based on my relationship with God. Because I've pledged allegiance to him and he is my boss. Determine it. It says determine to be faithful how long? To the end. There's no quitting. There's no stopping. There's no retirement plan. You end when the lid closes, they stick you in the furnace, whichever way you go, I don't care. That's when it ends. When this thing can stop, no longer proclaim the gospel, then that's when it ends. Be faithful to the end and you'll be saved. That's why I wanted to put it there. You'll be saved. See, there's no... There's, <clears throat> What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Maybe it will come. But there's no asterisk or whatever that you get saved if you don't do all this. Know what I mean? Determine to be faithful to the end, and then you'll be saved. So if there's any quitting along the way, it's probably not a good thing. How do we know? Because Luke 9, 62 tells us that. And Jesus told them, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. So that's scary. If you're walking out your Christian life and you keep looking like this saying, man, I wish I was kind of back in Egypt. Man, I wonder what them leeks taste like. I forgot what them leeks taste like. He says, you're not even fit for the kingdom. So again, I just wanted to encourage you with those two verses, even though they might not have sound encouraging, maybe with the importance of those two verses, that there's got to be no quit in you. You may not be running full steam. You may be walking. Sometimes you may be crawling. Sometimes you may be taking a break. But the thing is, you never, ever quit. Because if you quit, it says you ain't saved. Now, I can hear some of you. Not here, of course. You on the camera. But that's okay. So this week, I want to share with you another pitfall. I just want to kind of, like I said, I, these are not pre-made messages. You know, each, each week I'm asking God, what do you want? Where do we want to go with this? I got the main theme where we're going with this. We're being transformed, however it goes. But then he gives me stuff for maybe what we talked about a week or two ago. And I go, oh, yeah, that was good. Why couldn't you give me that two weeks ago? It's all right. I'll talk about it now. It's all good. So again, endurance. Hang in there. So this pitfall has been slowly creeping into the church. And if it's in the church, that means it's in the people of the church. Even though I'm going to talk about the church as a whole, the church as a whole is made up of people, right? So if it's in the body, it's in the people in the body. So, and that pitfall is what we want to call tolerance. There's a level of tolerance in the body that, and I can go a lot of different places with this. I really want to try to stay on track with where this goes. But unfortunately, we become very comfortable and or tolerant with things we never tolerated in the past. In fact, much of what is tolerated today used to be preached against in the past. And I believe tolerance has crept in under the guise of what the scriptures call the doctrine of demons. And we see that in 1 Timothy 4.1, where it says, But even so, the Spirit very clearly tells us that in the last times, some will abandon the true faith, because they've been devoted to spirits sent to deceive and sabotage. Do you understand? Spirits have been sent to deceive us and sabotage our walk of faith. It says, and mistakenly take, they will end up following doctrine of demons. 
Now let me give you this, and we're going to take a little sidetrack because God put it on my heart, so somebody must need to hear it. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 says this, Have two or three prophets speak, and let others with discerning gifts evaluate the messages they heard. Okay? So let me ask you, have you ever heard anything preached, prophesied, taught in a Bible class, spoken in a prayer group that didn't quite sit with you right? You heard something and you went, mm, I'm not sure. And then kind of after that feeling went away, all of a sudden all these other scriptures start coming to your mind that are like kind of exactly opposite to what you just heard. And what makes the situation even weirder is other people in that group or whatever are agreeing with what you said? I'm sure we've all been there. At least I have, I know. So how about you? So let me give you a little piece of advice here. Let's make this a teachable moment. How are you going to handle that situation if that actually happens? Well, if it happens here and it happens with me, you best come to me and talk to me. I'm not quite sure what you said because Many times we have a tendency in the body of Christ to talk amongst ourselves and about ourselves without actually going to the person that spoke the thing. So if I say something that don't quite set right, and you've got other scriptures running through your head, you best come to me and we'll sit down and discuss the matter. And if I've stated it wrong, I'll publicly admit it and repent of it and we'll move on. I don't know everything. I'm walking this thing out like you're all walking it out. And again, if it's in a ministry, we got a prayer group, we got, you know, Bible study like we used to have, then you feel free to address the issue in a loving, biblically based manner. That's what the scripture says, right? Two or three, speak and let others judge what they said. That needs to be, that's biblical. We need to do that. Now, if you're visiting another church, be quiet, ask the Spirit if you should get involved. You know, should I address this thing? I wouldn't kind of recommend doing it publicly, you know, but you may have to actually get up and leave. I've done that in the past. Sitting in a church and, you know, Mary Catherine was little and it's like I tap Mary and says, we're out of here. I said, I'll go out first like I'm going to the bathroom. Then you take Mary Catherine, you follow her. I'll meet you outside and I'm the car running. Because I ain't sitting under this. I don't know where they're going and what they're talking about, but man... So you may have to handle it that way. And then if you're in another Bible study, sometimes we get invited to Bible studies or other groups, you know, prayer groups or whatever, be quiet, ask the Spirit of God for direction. And again, if he wants you to address that with, with the people there, then, yeah, address it in a loving, biblical-based manner. You know, <clears throat> that's okay. But see, a common practice that I find in this tolerant church community is what I'm labeling it, is believers have become actively active participants in defining, redefining, and clarifying what the Bible has to say now. No longer is it thus saith the Lord, but thus saith the believer. And I'm old enough to remember back when Christians in the church allowed the Bible to clarify itself. But not anymore. We got preachers in the pulpit saying, well, yeah, I know what it says, but this is what it means. If somebody says that, you ought to already maybe like, where's my coat? I think I may have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it is. It's getting bad because why? The demons are out to sabotage and lead astray the flock of God. Why? That there'll be a great falling away at the end. It's a pitfall of tolerance that we have to be careful with. So like I said, there's many places I can go, and God's just been putting this on my heart this week especially, and it's in this area of unrighteousness. We have become way too tolerant in this area of unrighteousness. Now what is unrighteousness? It actually means not righteous. Okay, what does that mean? It means wicked, unfair, unjust, evil, dishonest, sinful, immoral, unethical, unlawful, vile, nefarious, wrong. That's what is unrighteous. And all too often, we're getting too comfortable with unrighteousness. 
And one of the mantras we like to say about it is, well, what am I going to do about it? And we use that to justify our tolerance of it. Reminds me of this story in Luke chapter 18, in 1 through 8. It's called the parable of the unjust judge. Probably know it. I'm going to read it to you out of the Passion Translation. It says this, one day Jesus taught the apostles to keep praying, never stop, or lose hope. Now again, when we read something, yes, there's a particular meaning to that text, but there's also principles we can pull out to use in life. And one of the principles we need to pull out right here is don't lose hope. A lot of people lost hope Wednesday over a stupid thing that happened a few miles away from here. Washington, D.C. in the capital, if I need to get a little more particular. Because we had all kinds of prophetic folks saying, Trump's in another four years. What happened? He says, why are you losing hope? Wait a minute, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Keep on praying, never stop, or lose hope. That's what it says, right? Because you're following along, I can tell. He shared with them this illustration. In a certain town, there was a civil judge, a thick-skinned and godless man who had no fear of others' opinions. Some of y'all need to get there. Toughen up a little, get some thick skin, and don't give a flip about what Joe Blow has to say. That's a holy hush, right? I'm letting the Spirit of God get that in you. Yeah, God, I'm there. Verse 3. And there was a poor widow in that town who kept pleading with the judge, grant me justice and protect me against my oppressor. So she's going to the judge with two things. I want justice. And grant me protection against those boneheads that ain't giving me justice. So, verse 4 and 5 says this, he ignored her pleas for quite some time. Just ignored her for a long time. But she kept asking. I don't think she was typing away on Facebook asking. She was getting in the guy's face. She was showing up on a regular basis, saying, I want justice and I want protection. But again, he didn't care. I don't care what you want. I'm the dude. I'm, I'm the judge. Not you. It says, eventually, he said to himself, this widow keeps annoying me, demanding her rights. And I'm tired of listening to her, even though I'm not a religious man and don't care about the opinions of others, I'll just get her off my back by answering her claims for justice, and I'll rule in her favor. Then she'll leave me alone. There is an entire sermon series just in that. Because in the body of Christ, there's no more endurance and there's no more t intolerance of unrighteousness. She kept going back. She kept going back because she knew what justice was. She demanded justice and protection against the unjust people. Now look at verse 6. The Lord continued. Now he's going to kind of, let's tie this in, boys. I gave you a real-life illustration. Now let's bring some spiritual application to it. The Lord continues, Did you hear what the ungodly judge said? That he would answer her persistent request. Don't you know that God, the true judge... Okay, let me ask you, do you know God's the true judge? And he's also a just judge, right? He's not the unjust judge. He's the true judge, and he's a just judge. It says, will grant justice. He will grant justice 
to all of his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. He will pour out his spirit upon them. He will not delay to answer you and give you what you ask for. Yeah, but he hasn't yet. Hello, big fly. <sighs> he will not delay to answer you and give you what you ask for. Why are you basing on his justice on what you see and feel and taste and touch? Why are you basing that as the proof that the thing actually happened or not? Verse 8, God will give swift justice to those who do not give up. Maybe the real problem is why you ain't seen it, because you actually gave up. Because he says he's going to give it to those that don't give up. So I'm a little fired up. Because this has been grating me bad. The tolerance of the body of Christ towards unrighteousness in this world is astonishing. He says, I'm going to give justice to those who don't give up. So be ever praying, ever expecting. Because see, folk pray and don't expect. Because when Peter was in the prison, the church was praying for him. He shows up and they're like, oh no, he ain't out there. What have you been doing? Oh, we're praying for Peter. The problem is you think it was going to happen the way you thought it was going to happen. You ain't the way maker. You are the expector that God is a just judge and he will bring swift justice if you don't quit asking him for it. Can you tell I'm a little fired up? Because I'm really trying to hold back, honestly, I am. Because there's some, a particular thing really on my heart bad and I'm, I don't really want to go there but it may leak out. He says, so be ever praying ever expecting just like the widow was with the judge. Why aren't you constantly hammering the thing? We think we're constantly hammering the thing if we are and I'm going to say the word bitching about the thing. Oh, I'm really hitting it hard. I'm on Facebook, like, really complaining. He said, yet, when the Son of Man comes back, this is huge. To me, this is the most important thing of what he's saying. He says, when the Son of Man comes back, Son of Man comes back, will he find this kind of persistent faithfulness in his people? Will he find this persistentness of going to God, the just God, and we are indignant about unrighteousness? We saw a huge unrighteous act happen last week. There was an illegitimate president in the office who was not voted in by we the people. And it's obvious. Okay? We don't need to make the arguments. But if you think that, oh, I've got to watch my mouth bad. If you think the guy who is being called president today got the most votes ever of any other human being in this country's history, you have an issue. There is absolutely no way. Because even if you do the math of what no one's disputing what President Trump got, 
there's not even enough people that voted to come up with the entire vote tally. So we'll just leave it there, along with all the other discrepancies. But for all the people who declared, all the prophets who declared and proclaimed, this is the real issue, because I don't give a flip about who's in any dome the building, because why? Read my hat. I'll probably wear it the Sunday I get it. Jesus is my boss. So I don't really care. That way, this is the point. If God has given you a word, why are you quitting on the word because of what you see? Why are you quitting on the word because of what you see? And why are you fighting with your brothers and sisters saying, oh no, you've got to accept the results of what happened. I will not accept unrighteousness as a result ever. Why? Because my God doesn't. Why? Because he's a just judge. And again, this has nothing to do with the election. That's not my point. My point is, are we tolerant as a person with injustice, unrighteousness? Because it goes to this place of, because I've heard some people say this, so I want to bring it around to this question and ask you this question. Does God in his infinite wisdom or will allow unrighteousness to occur? Because I've heard some people say, well, this current guy in the White House now is probably there because of what the church did, it's kind of judgment on the church to drive them underground because anytime the church goes underground, the church flourishes. So my brain goes to, you're accepting unrighteousness, never mind even the election. Abortion? Other sexual deviants and behaviors acceptable? When I read the book, it's hard to, like, tolerate that. Is being acceptable behavior, and not only that, having it shoved down our throat, that if we don't accept that kind of behavior, or whatever they're trying to push through, that we're really the ones that have the problem, and we really need to be reprogrammed. Okay. So again, let's look at the reality of things that are going on. Obviously, a real easy one is there's about there's thousands of people out of a job right now because of the guy who said he wasn't going to do what he actually did on the first day he sat down. Liar. We tolerate liars? Well, they all lie. Why do we accept that kind of behavior and not stand up to it and say, no, we are not going to accept lying? I'm just talking about tolerance. To what degree and what level are we allowing tolerance of unrighteousness to happen before we start acting like that woman and saying, no, I want justice. Now, we may not have a particular person we can go to right now, but guess who we can go through always? We can go to the just judge and say, God, that thing that happened was not just. Those policies getting rammed down our throats are not just. And Lord, I am going to batter heaven I am not going to pray for peace and unity. You already saw my video. If you didn't, it's on Facebook about peace and unity. And it's not like what some people are decreeing. I will not be at peace with unrighteousness. Abortion will never be acceptable. Deviant sexual behavior will never be acceptable. That doesn't mean I have to rail on the people that are caught up in it because they're blinded by it. It's not about the person. It's about accepting what is going on. 
And again, I'm not talking about the externals. I'm talking about where are you on the inside? Where are you when it comes to this issue of unrighteousness? Do you tolerate unrighteousness in your life to any degree? Does God tolerate it? Because if you think he does, and if some of you out there watching this think that God allowed this to happen so he could rain down his judgment, now you're talking about the sovereignty of God. What do you believe about the sovereignty of God? It goes back to the same question that we also always wrestle with, with healing, sickness, and disease. It boils down to this statement at the end. God can't give what he ain't got. God is never an unjust judge. God will never do anything that is unrighteous. See, when we think about the sovereignty of God and we've got no control about anything, you basically believe you absolutely have no say in the matter of this life and God will do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it, and you've got completely no say in the matter. That is a doctrine of devils. Because it goes against the very first scriptures where God created man. He said, let us make him in our image and we will give him authority over the earth. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, we are gardeners, field workers, laboring with God. Do you understand this is a team effort? God can't do anything on this earth unless you allow him to do it. That's blasphemous. No, that's Bible. Because he gave us the authority. He needs this mouth to speak his will on this earth. Then he can partner with us and do it. A lot of the junk that's happening on the earth is because Christians are spouting being done. Ah, stop. They're being Captain Obvious, declaring the situation and putting strength and power to it. Because they're not declaring God's righteous judgment over it. And I don't mean judgment in a bad way. No, abortions will cease in the city of Concord in Jesus' name. No, abortion is not acceptable in our woods. We are responsible for this area where he put us. Unjustice in that gold dome that we can see out our windows is never acceptable in this area. Ever. It ain't about a D or an R. It's about righteousness and unrighteousness and what will we tolerate as the body of Christ. Is there any unrighteousness in God? No. Psalms 29, 15. There is un no unrighteousness in Him. So He can't give what He doesn't have. Why would any believer? Man, oh. I saw this kid on Facebook, stupid kid. I told him what he said was blasphemous. God installed Biden as president. I went, oh, mercy. Why? Because God installs kings. You believe in a doctrine of devils. God is not unrighteous. God does not tolerate unrighteousness. In fact, judgment starts where? First. In the house of God with his own kids. Oh no, we're under the blood. We're all set. No, judgment starts first in the house of God. He does not tolerate unrighteousness of any kind, anywhere, even in his own family. So you think he's going to accept it out there in the devil's family? No. Please, don't misunderstand where I'm going and what I'm saying. How does God view unrighteousness? Romans 1.18. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. 
Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six evils God truly hates, and the seventh is an abomination to him. Putting others down while considering yourself superior. God hates that, you deplorables. He hates that bad. Because you're just too stupid to know how to live your life by yourself. We've we got to tell you how to live your life. Now he hates those who put down others while considering themselves superior. Spreading lies and rumors. There's too many to even go there. Shedding the blood of the innocent. Yeah, abortion kind of fits right there, don't he? No, it ain't acceptable under any condition. You know what? I've heard this before, so let's just deal with this lie now. It's the law of the land. I don't care. It's not righteous and acceptable to a just God. Man, I'm walking a thin line getting this video pulled down, ain't I? <laughs> <laughs> don't care plotting evil in your hearts towards another gloating over doing what's plainly wrong spouting lies and false testimony all those people that sit at senate hearings and stirring up strife between friends the voice translation puts it this way, anyone who stirs up trouble among the faithful. Stirring up trouble in the body that's going on right now over a flippant election and prophets saying one thing, backing down from one thing, others standing strong for one thing. It's creating insanity in the body right now. Believing that the Almighty God is somehow tolerant to whatever degree because he allows unrighteousness upon the earth will ultimately cause you to become tolerant to various degrees of unrighteousness upon the earth. We are to abhor sin and unrighteousness as the Father abhors sin and unrighteousness. We've got to stop apologizing and making allowances for unrighteousness. Don't even get me going in the church. You get people in the church living outside of marriage, running ministries, doing stuff in the church house. It's just... And again, I'm not mad at people. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'm mad at the spiritual leaders that are allowing that stuff to go on. I ain't talking about all the rank and file. I'm talking about the ones that stand up and say, I got to call a God in my life. And they tolerate all this junk. How many people voted for a person that was openly pro abortion and said, You can kill the baby once it's laying on the table and the mother's already birthed it? Now, again, it ain't about that. It's my, my attitude in my heart is, where, where, at what level are we going to stop accepting unrighteousness? What, at what level are we going to start hating the things God hates? When are we going to start standing up for those that can't have their own say? Orphans and widows. So again, it, it's, please understand, I'm not angry and upset. What I'm concerned about is all these pitfalls because these things will keep us from being transformed. If you quit in a race, you're done. If you're tolerating stuff, that means you're more afraid of that issue than you are of the fear of God. Because all these things relate to the fear of God. Do you fear God? Yeah. Then why aren't you standing up and declaring things unrighteous? Man, if I do that, I won't be woke anymore and I won't be able to find a job. And man, maybe I'll lose my bank account like other people are. And wow, wow, wow. I guess you fear them more than God. And again, it has to be determined in your heart, like I, let, like I read earlier, who is your boss? 
So where do we start? Let me give you a verse to wrap it up. This transformation stuff is tough. I mean, it's where the rubber meets the road. It's not a rah-rah, yeah, God's awesome, yeah, he is. Man, God wants to bless us, yeah, he does. Man, he wants to do amazing things in your life, yeah. He wants to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, yeah, he does. But if you keep partnering with the devil in certain areas, he's like, dude, you're shooting yourself in your foot. I can't bless that. I can't bless that. Because of your attitude towards it. Because you're more afraid of it than you are of me. It says in Psalms 139, 23 and 24, there's a voice translation that says this, Explore me, O God, and know the real me. Dig deeply and discover who I am. Put me to the test and watch how I handle the strain. When's the last time you asked God to do that in your life? Put me to the test, God, and see how I handle it. All right, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Throw you in the lion's den. Whatever. Oh, yeah, God, put me to the test. See how I handle it. Examine me to see if there is an evil bone in me. Or, I want us to think of this in the context of what we're saying this morning. Examine me to see if there is any tolerance of unrighteousness within me. God, is there any tolerance of unrighteousness within me? And guide me down your path forever. Lord, what am I tolerating in my life that I shouldn't be tolerating? And see, that's the thing that's scary today. We get constantly bombarded with stuff to cause us to conform, to cause us to be just like everyone else, to cause us to become tolerant, not understanding our tolerance of the thing is causing us to be intolerant and unrighteous before a holy God. Because he said, you be holy because I'm holy. You act like me and represent me. So for Christians to be tolerating things that are going on presently scares me. Now again, everyone's going to manifest their intolerance in different ways. Some may march with a sign downtown. Some may stand out in front of the state house. Some may do some prayer walking around it, which God's really been putting on my heart lately. Some may do whatever, but the question is, what are you doing? Are you doing? The one thing we all can do is go to Him. Persistently, God, this ain't right. God, I don't know how it's going to work out. See, that's been the problem with everyone backtracking now. Because everyone thought they had it figured out. Oh, it's going to happen on the 6th. Oh, it's going to happen on the 20th. Duh. I guess I was wrong. Mm, did you get a word from God? Well, I thought I did. What are you basing the word of God on? The results? Because if you are, Isaiah was a pretty bad false prophet because a lot of his stuff didn't come for some over a century later. Never mind, just a few months later. Yeah, but I thought. That's your problem. You ain't the way maker. You have no idea how anything is going to manifest, and it's not your responsibility to figure it out. Your responsibility is to be determined, stay in faith, keep on believing, keep on declaring, keep on confessing. Because again, it ain't about an election. It's not about an R and a D. It is about a world trying to conform us into one world system of unrighteousness and totally extinct us off the planet. That's been the devil's plan since the get-go. And it ain't ever changed. 
And his MOs never change. Yeah, did God say? Apparently a lot of prophetic folk are backpedaling on that lately. Yeah, God said. He's a just judge. And if you stay persistent, justice will come swiftly. And with the body divided, how is justice going to come swiftly? If we can't even get our act together around unrighteousness. I can partner with anybody that wants to see righteousness done. I don't care who they are and what they are. I don't even care if they're born again yet. We have this innate thing in us that we hate injustice, don't we? I don't care who you are. The littlest kids fighting with each other. Mom, it ain't fair. It ain't fair. It ain't fair. He did this. It ain't fair. We know on the inside it, life ought to be just and injustice is not to be tolerated. But why have we come to this place that, well, I guess God allowed all these things happen? Do you know why? Because we need to have some sense of understanding to have peace of mind as a human being. We need to rationalize it to the place that our intellectual, natural brain can put some pieces together and say, okay, I'm good with that. That makes sense. That's not where we walk as spirit beings. Because you don't make sense out of spirit stuff. Because if you did, there'd be no, there's nothing impossible for God. Because if you could figure it all out, impossible is gone because there is no impossible. Because you figured it out. I don't care how things happen. That's not my job. My job is to go to the judge who is just and ask him for justice. Not my way, justice. The devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Stealing is unjust. Killing is unjust. Destroying is unjust. God, bring justice and bring it swiftly. Okay, you're going to stay persistent at it? You bet, God. And know what? Look inside and see if there's any injustice in me that I need to get rid of. Is there anything I'm tolerant that you don't tolerate in me that I need to get rid of? Doesn't mean you got to address it. You know why you ain't addressing it? Because you're tolerating it. You got to get to the place where you don't tolerate it. Now that doesn't mean you're going to go out and start cutting off ears like Peter did. No. But you're never going to change it until you get to the place where you no longer tolerate it. So search me, oh God. I ain't going to ask for no more pressure. The devil's doing a good enough job with that. But Lord, you know what? When all's said and done, I want to get to the end of there and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to get caught in any of the pitfalls. I don't want to stop halfway. I don't want to fall in a hole. And that's all I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to I'm just, as I've said for a few months now, I feel like I'm the watchman on a wall, seeing things going on and just declaring. And people are saying, no, you're not seeing right. No, you don't know what's going on. That's okay. Because again, it's not my job to open your eyes. Because he says in Ephesians 1, Lord, I pray that their eyes would be open. I pray people's eyes are open. Not my job to open them. Not my job to tell you how to fix it. Just need to declare a kingdom. You need to declare a kingdom. But the thing is, we need to stand firm on righteousness. And that can incorporate a whole lot of stuff. I mean, you could preach two years just on, this is unrighteous, this is unrighteous. Go through the book on all the stuff. We just need to grab it as a whole. <laughs> Stop wavering when God tells you something. Told you before, God has told me some stuff that if I was to share publicly, they'd say, you're crazy. You're right, because you weren't supposed to hear it, and it wasn't for you. It was for me along my path. And it brought me peace in my life, because I was confused about some things. 
It wasn't for you. It was for me. You could have the same relationship, do the same thing. All right, we're done. I hope I didn't hurt you too much. I don't ever want to hurt you. But we do got to wake up, guys. We got to wake up bad. You do know the end of the book is actually going to happen, right? It will happen. And just for plan B, in case the flying thing don't work, you better have a plan B. I'm helping you with the plan B. Endurance. Righteousness. The fear of the Lord. Knowing He's the boss and you will bow to none other. That's not plan B. That is plan A. But if the flying thing don't work, we still got to endure to the end and then we'll be saved as we just read, right? You got to endure to the end. There is no falling in a hole. There's no quitting. There's no tolerating. Now again, however that manifests, that's between you and God. But let the other guy manifest it. Don't ever say he's a nut because he's down, downtown holding a placket. God's already put some things in my mind about downtown that I'm kind of wigging out about. You'll drive by and see me sitting there and say, that ain't my preacher, though. I don't know that guy. Man, my, my mittens. Somebody knit me a pair of mittens. But we got to do that. We see prophetic acts all through the book. That's what I mean. Let each other be each other. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Stop tearing up one another and telling one another what we ought to do. The Bible says encourage the saints. Best way to encourage is tell the truth, right? That's, what I, that's all I try to do. We tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate. And it's not because we're bad. We've been programmed to. We really have. Can you imagine if our grandparents were alive and they looked at this world today, what they would think? <laughs> Never mind our parents. I'm talking about our grandparents. Let's go back. Our grandparents, if they were alive today and see what was going on, they would wig out and say, how the hell did you let all this happen? What have you been doing? And again, it's because we've tolerated. Now why? Because it wasn't that bad. There you go, babe. Frog in the pot. Until all of a sudden you're cooked and someone's eating you and you say, how did I get here? Father, help us, please. Look deep inside. And Lord, again, it's not a sin thing. It's not a, it's not that. But it's a phase of transformation, Father. It's a pitfall that will stop us dead in our tracks. The enemy knows what we've tolerated. The enemy knows how to put pressure on us so that we will continue to tolerate things. Father, in these last days, we need your body to stand up and say, no, we will no longer tolerate injustice. We will be a righteous people, and we will not tolerate unrighteousness. Now, again, how all that works, Lord, I don't know. You're the way maker. I don't know. But, Father, it needs to be instilled back in your house. Not just this physical location at 21 Nunkley Street, but in these temples that are occupying this house right now. In those that watch online right now. Righteousness needs to reign in your house once again. And when we get accused of all those things we'll get accused of, Lord, it's not going to matter because we already know they're going to hate us for your namesake. So, Father, help us. Examine us. Be gracious when you do, please. And allow us to work out some stuff. Because, Lord, you've told us we need to endure the end to the end and be faithful in order to be saved. 
And Lord, you've already said many are going to fall away. And Father, I don't want to see any fall away. I don't want to fall away. Really, the only one I can control is me. I'm not saying I had to control people, but it's, it's hard to see people fall away. Because you love them and you care about them and you just want the best for them. Because, Father, that's all we're talking about is your goodness and your mercy and your glory reigning in our lives. We're not the judge. You are. But, Lord, you stole us to stand up for righteousness, just like that woman who kept going to that judge. May we be that persistent, at least in prayer, because we all can do that, Lord. And then from there, you show us specifically what we can do as an individual to make a difference and stand up in this world. Because honestly, Lord, the devil's kids have no problem standing up for unrighteousness and being very bold and blatant about it. May we be just as bold and blatant. We don't need to participate in the same kind of behavior, but we need to be just as bold and just as blatant in it. Because we know righteousness will reign because you are the true judge. So Lord, may we be that example of who truly is our King and our Lord in our daily life. Father, we thank you for this time. As we go now, guide us and direct us by your Spirit. Do a work in our lives that we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Be blessed.